All right, so let's move on to the elements of composition. One of the most impactful elements in a photograph is depth. There are a few things that come into play here, but the idea is to give the photo dimension. I usually look for a point of interest in the front, middle, and back of the photo to give the viewer a sense of the scene. Here in this shot, you see we have a log in the front, the water with the reflection in the middle, and the rock and the sky in the background. Aside from points of interest, there are a few other things that can add dimension to your photos. Light is one of them. Think about a sketch of an apple where it gets darker and has more contrast in the shadows. This makes the object appear three-dimensional. The same applies in the photo where the shadow and highlights will help shape your subject. Most people prefer to shoot around sunset and sunrise when the sun is lower in the sky and shapes the landscape a bit more. The reason is that if you shoot when the light is even or directly overhead, this can make the landscape appear a bit more flat and dull. Of course, we can shape the light in editing as well to help direct the viewer's eye where we want and add some more dimension to the photo. People's eyes naturally go straight to the brightest area in a photo, so knowing this, we can frame our shot to highlight a point of interest with the light or shape the light to direct the viewer's eye into the scene. Some other elements that can add dimension to your scene are dust and haze, as well as mist and fog. This can add separation between the elements, a lot like the shading in the sketch, to where they give a more visual sense of the space in the photo. Here you can see the light hitting the dust in the Grand Canyon causes separation and dimension to the rocks. Lastly, we can show depth by using a lower aperture and have some areas out of focus. This is going to add dimension to the photo by showing a more shallow depth of field, meaning shorter focal plane. You see this a lot with wildlife and portraits and not so much with landscapes, but that's not to say you can't do it. It's just an artistic choice to not have the whole photo sharp and it can produce some beautiful effects. Speaking of leading a subject's eyes through a scene, we can do this also with leading lines. Leading lines can be something natural like a log or lines in sandstone or even something man-made like a bridge. The idea is that you frame these things up to where the lines lead to a point of interest or your intended subject. This could be a single line or multiple lines, for example, or an S-curve from perhaps a river or a road. Here's an example of leading lines at the Wave in Arizona. The lines guide your eyes from the bottom left of the frame to the center. In this photo, the foam from the water leads your eyes straight to the rock at Martin's Beach. But as you can see from this shot at Monument Valley, the leading line is the road directing your eye from the left of the frame into the valley. These lines will not only add depth to the frame, but also direct the viewer's eye in a calculated and pleasing way. Another way to direct the viewer's eye is by framing the subject with surrounding elements. In this shot here at Secret Beach, I frame the center using the trees in the foreground. In Sedona at the Birth Cave, the actual cave frames up the mountains and the Milky Way in the background in this shot. An example in a city could be buildings framing up a plane in the sky. Another important factor in a photograph is balance. Ideally, you want the points of interest in a photo to complement each other and not dominate by being too heavy on one side. If there's too much going on in one part of the photo, the viewer's eyes will go straight to that part and stop. We wanna create photos that lead people's eyes through them, making them wanna keep looking. In this photo, you can see that the tree and Milky Way are the two most interesting points, but they're bunched together on the right, leaving too much negative space on the left. In this shot, you can see that the elements are more spread out and we get more of a balanced and pleasing composition. Symmetry also kind of falls along the lines with balance. This can work with the actual landscape where one side mirrors another, or when you have reflections, for instance. Reflections also work standalone to help create interesting foregrounds. I'm always looking for small or large puddles or bodies of still water to get a reflection in a scene but if it's windy, it'll be very challenging, if not impossible, to get a still reflection. Another factor that comes into play is the rule of thirds. This suggests that you should place points of interest on the middle lines and the thirds of the frame. To help visualize this, you can switch on the grid in your camera while in live view to see the third lines. The rule implies that if you put your subjects on the thirds line, that it will create a more interesting image than if the subject was centered. This is true in a lot of scenarios, but also it's just a rule and most definitely can be broken. Oftentimes, I center the subject as well if I believe the subject is significant enough. Again, rules are just guidelines. Sometimes it just won't work in some scenes. Similarly to leading lines, you can also use patterns to direct the viewer's eye. This can also add dimension to the photo when combined with directional light where the shadows and highlights shape the elements in the patterns. You can also create some really cool abstract artwork with the natural patterns found in landscapes. Don't be afraid to experiment and fill the frame with them. Here you can see that the aerial view of Utah Badlands produces some really interesting abstract designs that almost look like a painting. Another thing that I love to do is exaggerate elements in the foreground using a wide angle lens. This effect is from the distortion that super wide lenses create at the edges of the frame where things appear wider than normal. In this photo, you can see that these flowers appear to be very large, but in reality, they're actually very small. The wide angle lens positioned right above them actually makes them appear bigger. 
you generally have to focus stack to get everything sharp using this wide angle technique. The one drawback is that when you shoot these super wide lenses, the foreground will appear larger, but the background will become tiny. You can offset this by taking a separate photo more zoomed in and then edit them together in Photoshop. This is called perspective blending. In this example, you can see that I shot the foreground super wide at 14 millimeters and then took a separate shot at 24 millimeters for the butte in the background with the sky. I then perspective blended them using a layer mask in Photoshop. One last element that I'll suggest is to add people into your landscape pics. This is often overlooked, but can help tell a story with the photo. A person further away can show the scale of a scene, especially with a wide angle lens. As I just mentioned, the further something is from the camera using a wide angle lens, the smaller it will appear. Alternatively, a photo with a person closer up to the lens makes you feel like you're there with them and tells a story of their adventure and journey. Pro tip, use a tripod and self timer to photograph yourself if you don't have someone with you.